Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff from Boston University will share with us his commentary. I'm afraid due to uh, time constraint, we will have to limit uh, the commentating time to 15 minutes. So please welcome Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff with a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. It's an honor. Uh, I want to thank the uh, World Knowledge Forum for inviting me. I'm just going to, since I have uh, to squeeze 20 minutes into 15, I'm going to go very fast. Uh, this is going to be a, uh, a tough love talk for Thomas. We agree on a lot of things, but we disagree on a lot of things. I'm going to focus on what we disagree on to be hopefully helpful. Uh, I take, Thomas has got a huge book. There's lots in it that I agree with, but uh, three key propositions in his book are that our, our the return to capital that investors receive exceeding the growth rate of the economy, G, implies r r rising wealth inequality. The key empirical proposition is that there is r rising wealth inequality going on in the U.S. and other countries, developed countries. There's a key policy recommendation, which is annual, an annual wealth tax that's quite steep and that would um, dramatically reduce uh, uh, the wealth holdings of the uh, super wealth, wealthy and many other uh, people even below that. So does R greater than G imply rising wealth inequality? I think economic science is very clear that that's not the case. Uh, let's look at the, the core fundamental model of s savings and wealth accumulation, which is the life cycle model. Take a model in which people just live for two periods, they're young, they work. Uh, the rich earn E sub R, the poor earn E sub P. In the standard simplest model, uh, they, they uh, the young save a share. In the case of the rich, it's alpha sub R of their wages, and they bring that into old age as wealth. The poor save alpha sub P. Alpha sub R and alpha sub P are viewed as independent of the interest rate. Now, because um, ER, the earnings of the rich are bigger than EP, the earnings of the poor, you have that the wealth of the rich exceed the wealth of the poor. That's inequality in wealth. But it doesn't have anything to do with R or really G or the difference between the two of them. That's the basic standard model of savings and growth and inequality that we have as a tool in economics. That's the life cycle model for which many Nobel Prizes have been awarded, which Irving Fisher did the seminal work over a, uh, about 100 years ago. Now, wealth inequality in the life cycle model is really due to wage inequality. It's not due to R, R being bigger than G. Over time in the life cycle model, if you start out an economy with a lot of capital and R is low because there's a lot of capital relative to labor, the wages of the rich and the poor will be high. And so the gap between them will be high. But over time, the capital stock uh, will decline if you've got uh, more than a steady state level of capital. Wages will decline. R will rise. And wealth inequality, if we measure it by the gap between the rich and the poor wealth holdings, will fall. So you get exactly the wrong implication. Uh, you get that uh, as R rises, uh, wealth relative to G, wealth actually gets smaller. Wealth inequality measured that way. And if you look at the ratio of wealth, uh, which is really comes down to the ratio of earnings, that stays constant through time. So I don't believe that R greater than G implies growing wealth inequality, certainly not in the uh, life cycle model. But the life cycle model does not include bequests. So let's add in bequests. And if you look at the uh, models with bequests, as long as the uh, rich and the poor leave a fixed share of their lifetime net resources as net bequests, then again, you can get stable wealth. In e you can get um, that uh, the economies produce stable wealth distributions with stable levels of bequests relative to GDP and inheritances, and ours is bigger than G. You do not get rising wealth inequality. And the reason really is that the rich say, uh, spend as well as save, just like the poor spend and, and, and save. There's no evidence that the rich do nothing but save and that the poor do nothing but spend. There's no evidence of that, really. And um, there is a model of uh, 
wealth inequality in which R matters relative to G, and that's, but that's really a cr kind of a crazy model in which uh, there's two dynasties, uh, one family, extended family that lives for, through generation after generation, always uh, has a higher preference for its descendants, cares more about its descendants, and wants to always save really uh, at a higher rate than the poor, than other just dynasties. Well, that model produces extreme inequality, and it has, in the long run, one dynasty owning all the wealth, and also doing no consumption base, very little consumption because they're saving so much. And that's very good for everybody because having very rich people accumulate a lot of wealth that we can then use to work with because wealth finances capital, that's a very good thing for the poor. So we wouldn't want to stop that accumulation. Uh, now, intergenerational altruism of the kind that you need for that kind of model has been very strongly rejected by U.S. data, uh, at least so in the U.S. at least, there's very strong evidence against that kind of a model. Households basically spend as if they're unrelated. They're not like in any dynasty, like you see uh, the evidence of it in the Imperial Palace here in Seoul, that beautiful palace uh, I got to visit uh, yesterday. Now, uh, there's lots of wealth mobility among the super rich. You know, if you look at the Forbes 400 richest people, 60% uh, of them on that list in 2011, 2001 weren't there uh, 12 years before. There's a huge turnover in who's wealthy. So if you had all the wealth, rich just holding on to their wealth, saving it, spending nothing, then you wouldn't see this change and all getting the same rate of return. Uh, you wouldn't see this turnover in who's the wealthiest. That turnover is ha having to do with wage inequality um, and other, many other factors. And 25% uh, of, of those richest people in uh, 2001 weren't listed in 1998. So just in three years, you have enormous turnover. Now, Thomas's statement is that in his book is that economists are all too often preoccupied with mathematical problems of interest only to themselves. Here's my statement. Economists who ignore economic theory do so at their intellectual peril. I think there's some, some failure to look carefully at economic theory and connect uh, what we see in the data with economic theory, economics. What really explains wealth inequality? Well, there's wage inequality, the biggest factor. There's unherded and learned skills inequality. There's a family environment, uh, career choices, connections, luck work leisure preferences, outsourcing, foreign competition, robots, smart machines, which are intre increasingly taking over jobs of uh, low-skilled low workers, assorted of mating. I marry somebody who earns a lot more, or I marry somebody who earns a lot less. Uh, how many kids I have, if I leave money, how many kids is it being spread out over? There's divorce, multiple divorces. Uh, the divorce rate in the US is 52%. There's remarriage. Uh, there's random dates of death. Some people die young, some people die early. A lot of poor people die young. They leave disproportionately more money to their kids. That's why the basic impact of inheritance is actually, inheritance is actually to equalize wealth, not make it unequal. And that's what uh, Joe Stiglitz showed in an early paper. In the absence of any government policy to change the, who, get, who inherits, you actually have inheritance being an equalizing factor when it comes to wealth inequality. This again is what the economic theory says. Uh, tax policy, transfer policy. Yes, the rich have a very high share of the assets, but in my country, the poor have a very high share and indeed a rising share of the transfer payments. For example, Medicare is a, Medi Medicaid is a benefit, a health benefit to the poor. How, how unequal is that? It's very unequal, and it's gotten very much more unequal through time. That the poor, so we have some things that are getting more equal, and some things are getting for the, you know, more unequal towards the rich, and other things are getting more unequal towards the poor. We need a picture of overall inequality, not just one thing here and one thing there. We need to put it all together. Uh, so there's other factors. Now, I did a very detailed study over a course of a year with three co-authors. It's a life cycle model, R exceeds G, and we have all the, almost all those factors that we, I just listed in that model, in that simulation study. Uh, and you are able to 
to, with no in, intended inheritances, with no bequest uh, motive whatsoever, where people just leave bequests because they, they're not fully annuitized, they just leave their money accidentally, you find that you can replicate the U.S. Uh, Gini coefficient, you can replicate the top 1% share, uh, you can have a stable wealth distribution, and higher R does not produce uh, higher wealth inequality. The, um, now, the key empirical fact in the book is that wealth inequality has been rising. Uh, th that can be questioned on a, not, a lot of fronts in terms of the actual data. Uh, but I want to point out that what we define to be wealth very much influences our answer to this question about rising wealth inequality. For example, in the U.S., a typical low middle class household earning about $30,000, husband and wife, these folks are social security millionaires. If you look at their benefits at age 60, they've got claims as future social security benefits of over a million bucks. Uh, that's not counted as part of wealth inequality measures as conventionally defined where wealth is defined just as uh, financial assets and real, uh, real assets. Uh, so I don't think you can study wealth inequality if you exclude most of the wealth of the poor and the middle class. And most of, most of the wealth of the poor and middle class is in the form of, in the U.S. at least, Medicare benefits, Medicaid health benefits to the elderly from the government, and Social Security benefits. And you also have private pension benefits, which are also hard to, hard to calculate in these uh, standard studies. Um, now, uh, the policy implication is to have a uh, of Thomas's book is a high, have a high annual wealth tax. I think it's dangerous to recommend new policies without understanding the policies that are now in place. I list here 20, uh, let's see, there's 23, I just went fast, different fiscal systems in the U.S. Uh, I can't, I don't know how the, this thing goes back, but income tax, state income taxes, uh, earned income tax credit, which is a part of the federal income tax, transfer programs of all kinds, food stamps, Medicare, Medicaid, it goes on and on, 23 different programs. Uh, you need to look at all those things collectively to understand whether or not we need to have a wealth tax uh, like Thomas is recommending in the U.S. Now I want to show you a study that I'm just uh, uh, about to uh, bring out with Alan Auerbach, who's a professor at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley. This shows you the average tax rate for 40 to 49-year-olds I'm looking at uh, quintiles uh, of lifetime resources, remaining lifetime resources. So we got the lowest 20% of people with assets and future labor income. That's lifetime resources. So take the tw rank these, rank everybody in the sample, the survey of consumer finances from the Federal Reserve. Rank them from the highest resources, remaining lifetime resources to the lowest. Take the top 20%. They're facing a 50. Uh, a 32 percent tax rate over the rest of their life in terms of taxes net of transfers. 32 percent, almost a third of their remaining lifetime resources are going to go to somebody else, taken from them to the by the government and handed to somebody else. Who is it being handed to? Well, these first three quintiles are actually facing negative lifetime tax rates. For example, the lowest quintile is getting a transfer on net, net of taxes, that really equals their resources. It's negative 92%, 96%. Here's average spending. Look at the red bars. That's the spending inequality that you would have without any government intervention in the U.S. in terms of lifetime remaining spending and present value. The blue chart, the blue bars, columns, are the spending inequality after the tax transfer system has done its job. And you can see that things are much more equal. So our, our system is highly progressive. Now you might claim that it's not progressive enough. There's still a lot, there's still a lot of inequality in remaining, re, what is really lifetime spending, remaining lifetime spending. But uh, it's nothing like the inequality that you see in the red columns. Now let me show you the last uh, chart here and then I'll conclude. This is um, asset and in inequality uh, uh, Asset and spending inequality by quintile, again, for this middle-aged cohort. Assets for the top 20%, the richest 20% of people in the U.S., they've got over 70% of the assets. 
of the wealth plus the real estate assets. But if you look at the inequality in the remaining lifetime spending, it's much lower. Their share is only 40%. And the share at the very end, the first quintile, is really low without the redistribution of the government, but then it's higher. So I'm not saying that this is desirable degree of inequality. I'm just saying that you can't leave out these other aspects of the whole process of wealth accumulation and taxation and uh, redistribution through many, many mechanisms like I marry somebody who's uh, earning a lot less or, uh, or somebody who's earning a lot more and I have 15 kids rather than no kids. All these things percolate and matter through time. Now, let me just conclude. Um, the, uh, I don't believe R greater than G really has anything or much to do with wealth inequality. I say this from um, the simulation studies from, and from the basic theory. I believe that wealth properly measured is much more equally distributed than Thomas suggests. So, for example, I would include Medicaid wealth, Medicare wealth, Social Security wealth, private pension wealth. Uh, all these things matter. And some of these pictures of income inequality growing are reflecting the fact that the government's grabbing a bigger and bigger share of people's labor income over time and handing it back to them in the future in benefits. Or, or private employers are big, grabbing a bigger share of their compensation, especially of the low and middle class workers in the form of health care premiums for insurance, health insurance or for defined benefit contributions that they're making on behalf of the employer. employer. So I'm saying that every number you see, yet whether it's coming from me or some, from some other economists, including Thomas, needs to be questioned because uh, uh, it's, this is a tricky business. This is complicated business, but we need to keep an eye on the theory. So let me just say in, the, in closing that a highly progressive wealth tax, it, I'm also not happy to see Bill Gates and Warren Buffett ha having so much wealth. And uh, maybe we should be taxing them at a very high rate. But let's understand what Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, the two richest men in the US, are doing with their wealth. They're distributing it, all, almost all of it, they're bequeathing almost all of it to the poorest people in the world through the Gates Foundation. So it's a complicated story. I think Thomas deserves a world of credit for focusing attention on inequality. I am very concerned about wage inequality expanding because of smart machines in particular taking over people's jobs, how that's going to end. Uh, but I think we need to stick very close to the theory and think very carefully about the data before we draw too strong a set of conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your commentary, Professor Lawrence Codley-Coffin.